Hey, everybody, welcome to The Conversation. You're with Andy Mason, and this is Authentic Conversations around the messy intersection of faith, family, and business. And I have with me today Brandon Showalter. Brandon is a journalist with the Christian Post based just outside of Washington, D.C., and I really want you to have a listen to this story. We're going to get in behind the scenes of what actually happened, some significant moments that shifted him from just being a wandering through life to God actually got his attention and thrust him into this role. And then he was actually working within the role. And he has, I, I, I'd like to say stumbled, but stumbled is not the right language. He's literally being thrust into a front position seat of actually doing journalism and research about some things that your children really need to be protected and cared for and you need to know about. And there's a book that's just been launched. It's called Exposing the Gender Lie. If you look that up by Brandon Showalter and a friend of his, you'll find out more. Make sure you get that. And here we go. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Andy. Good to be here with you today. Brandon, I gave you a kind of a very broad stroke kind of introduction. Tell us a little bit more about what you actually do. Well, you're correct. I am a journalist with the Christian Post. I've been so since the summer of 2016. Um, it has really, it's it's life on the front lines. I, I never expected to be a journalist. And once I got hired, everybody, it seemed like they said to me, oh, that's just so perfect for you. And oh, heck if I knew. But uh, that, that's that's been life ever, almost, it's coming up on uh, seven years in June. Um, yeah. Um, just did graduate school at the Catholic University of America. I was graduating uh, from about a year ago, uh, but I rejoined the Christian Post in a full-time capacity, and I wear many hats there now. A lot of it's from the gritty work I was doing before graduate school. I'm working in several different roles now, um, doing a lot more public speaking, some podcasting, some column writing, and an editorial department, but the Christian Post is a good place. Great. Well, congratulations on your graduation. And there's a couple of really significant moments in this journey of partnering with God in our place of work, finding our assignment. Yours was super interesting. None, mm. of, none of what you did, you thought was lining you up for this. Tell yeah. us how you stumbled into journalism and really how did God lead you that way? Well, I am a graduate of the Bethel School of Ministry in Redding, California, which is where I met you. Gosh, shoot, that's been 10, 10, 11 years ago now. Yeah. Um, and during my third and final year, I was working part-time, three many different jobs to make ends meet. And I was working as a janitor. And I was thinking about, I, I knew that I was going to be coming back to the Washington, D.C. area where I had lived previously. Um, and so while mopping floors and scrubbing toilets in the Lake Building in Reading, I was just praying and doing my work and scrubbing porcelain thrones and mopping the floors and I was thinking, you know, I should really write something. It was just this kind of idea that I had. I felt this urge to write. And so I thought, well, what am I going to write about? And I'm going to write about being a church janitor. And I ended up emailing a friend and say, I know you run this blog for, it's like a faith conversation website where it has religions of all kinds, but there's a Christian channel. And so I sent, is there any interest in publishing? I just wrote this essay about what it was like to be a church janitor. He loved it. He published it and he said, submit again. So I wrote on a completely different theme for the next time, and then he published that one, and then I wrote two more, and he published those. They they all did pretty well, and so I he offered me my own blog on the channel. And so then I sort of I finished third year of school of ministry and then go back to D.C., and I worked three different jobs, including this blog that I'm not able to do very often, but just for fun, just kept the writing thing going because I just yeah. felt this urge to sort of write and just see where it went. And, that was a very rough, you know, first year back after having lived three years in Reading, and then I was, you know, looking to do something, and I was very, I came, I, I almost had a borderline mental breakdown <laughs> one year after that, but I, I applied, I, this opportunity came to be a reporter, a journalist at the Christian Post, and I had this blogging experience from this Faith Conversation website, so I used those blogs as writing samples to apply for the job. I met all the other qualifications with the degree and whatever, you know. I didn't study journalism in college, but all the other specifications, um, it's just kind of crazy. Um, how, And it ended up um, interviewing for the job, and uh, 
they they brought me on. Uh, it was, but I that that writing experience, blogging, which was hatched while scrubbing toilets and mopping floors, was where it sort of where it all started. So I sort of say that I got my start in journalism while mopping floors and scrubbing toilets. Yeah, and so I love that. If you're listening to this and you're wondering, God, use me, use mm -hmm. like I want to do something significant yeah. for you. Get busy cleaning toilets. And Whatever's in front of you. Yeah. Whatever is in front of you, do it with excellence. And Brandon would sing as he would clean. Yeah, and invite the presence of God in those places. I'm sure there were some throne room experiences in a very different kind. Yeah. But you did that. You had this idea and then you took a risk and followed it. So you're working in the Christian post. At what point did you hear God say, what's it going to be, fear or faith? And that was actually during the interview. Um, one of the things I was afraid of was uh, I didn't know if I could write quickly because I fought over my writing. I just carefully chose every word. And I went in there for the interview. Well, let me back up just a little bit. I, I had applied and I hadn't heard anything. And a week and a half later, I called a friend from Wisconsin. and said, I really, I just got to do something different. I'm wearing out. I'm just the end of my rope here. And he said, well, let's pray. We did literally two seconds after we he said, in Jesus' name, amen. Ding, you've been invited for an interview. I remember the parking lot in which wow. that happened. It's true. It literally, that's how it happened. And so I sort of took that. that that's a pretty nice sign. Uh, interview was scheduled about a week and a half or two later. And then when I got in there for the interview, they gave me a quiz. And I tested my knowledge and interviewed. One of the questions that they asked me, can you write two to five articles a day? And I was just dreading getting a question like that because I wasn't sure if I could. Yeah. Because as soon as I heard the editor ask that question, I sensed that still small voice of the Holy Spirit asked me, what's it going to be, fear or faith? And, be and, before, and before I could even uh, say anything, I heard the following words come out of my mouth. I'm up to the challenge. And indeed, it was a challenge. But that was the kind of way I expressed faith was to say, I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Um, and so they brought me on for a trial. And the first, first day was in mid middle of June. 2016, and I was officially hired at the end of July. I love it. So as you're listening to this, pay attention. I want you to hear that Brandon is a regular guy. He is working out his way. He is pursuing Jesus and all that he's doing, growing your relationship, taking risk. He gets an idea, and he follows through on that idea. And that, But still, this is like, God, this is not making sense. Praise, an opportunity comes up. And in the middle of that, but I can't. I've got all of these reasons why I could potentially be disqualified or disqualify myself. And I think I remember you saying, you know, I, I, like, am I really up to the challenge of being like, can I, like, you used to believe that you were a terrible writer. I did, like, actually did. Yeah, that's true. And it's, you can see this. So this is like not necessarily a genius strength growing yeah. up, but I want you to see this, how God takes people that are willing and available, and let's see what happens. So fast forward, the first day you really get going, there's, there's a mass shooting in a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida, and like, hey, you got to report on that. Yeah. Then you track down, and you're obviously navigating this, this, this whole space. It's not just skipping through the roses and uh, God is good all the time. It, actually, it's you're right in the coalface of reporting on cultural wars, right. messy stuff, fights over uh, gender ideology and theology and politics. It's it's messy. So talk, yeah. fast forward to the point at which this suddenly went deep dive. You know, reporting on Orlando, that's, that's messy, that's painful, that's hard. But what you're doing right now is another whole level. Talk to me about how you – stumbled or were thrust into the whole space of gender and children and surgeries and transitioning young people? Well, it was kind of a rude awakening. Um, one of the things that happened after that shooting, it was I was tasked with writing articles about at least one. I, I, that, that whole that whole event really transpired a lot of discussion about how do we respond to tragedy, particularly given the touchiness of these issues and that kind of thing. And one of my editors came in the newsroom and said, you know, Brandon, we don't have to edit your pieces for tone because you're communicating 
our lens where, I mean, we as a publication, we are the Christian Post. We have a perspective. We're grounded on a very biblical statement of faith, ecumenical kind of publication. But she said, you know, we're, we're grateful that we don't have to edit your pieces for tone because you're striking the right balance. And I'm thinking, well, newbie journalist, maybe I'll just, if I'm having success here, I'll continue on in this same vein. And about two months later, the senior uh, managing editor comes in and he says, I need somebody to write a piece on conversion therapy, as they call it. And so for someone that doesn't know, what is conversion yeah. therapy? Well, <laughs> that's kind of a, it's, it's used as a scare term for for persons who would like to receive counseling because they're conflicted about their sexuality or they're dealing with gender confusion or any kind of really sort of tough usually sexual but not always issue to talk about with and so with with a counselor with a licensed um, therapist and that kind of thing um and because of the influence of lgbt activists um, in certain states and locales they're trying to ban those practices um and so we wanted to treat the issue of those bans being considered in these various states and locales with our understanding of the human person, Christian anthropology. What does it mean to be human, male and female? What's really going on here? Uh, and I noticed especially that these conversion therapy bans were increasingly, and I didn't know this at the time, being applied to the gender stuff. So if a young girl was confused about her body and she believed that she was male, she could then not get counseling with any therapist who would then say, no, your body's fine you you're you know xx <laughs> chromosomes you're, you're you're you may have gender atypical atypical interests for someone who is your sex but there's nothing wrong with your body that would be illegal in, in these where these bands states yeah. in states and so that really opened my eyes but when so i you, you, so you reported you did so some- well <laughs> here's what happened he came in there and i'm thinking should i volunteer to do this um i had just started in journalism and i was just sort of hedging um, and I was doing that very Washington DC. Is this going to impede my career? Is if I take on this issue, if I report, is it going to hurt me or help me? Gonna hurt me, help me. I started just melling around. And I, I remember walking across the newsroom and as clear as day, Andy, I, I heard that still small voice, the Holy spirit say to me, Brandon, are you ashamed of the gospel? Come on. And I remember thinking, no, and I said, no, Lord, I'm not. And then he said, write the article. And so I did. And so that was, I, I was a very critical moment because I knew I wanted, I just had to listen to the Lord and be obedient about the tough stuff. And it was really, I, I think that's the, kind of the, the point at which I just dove in. And I then started to learn about how this was so much deeper than I ever knew. And I started so pause, to pause for a moment, Brandon. I want people to hear this. Yeah. So number one, you're following Jesus. You want to serve him with your life. And you've got training in a background and an undergraduate degree and nothing related to this. You don't even think you're a good writer. Yeah. You write a couple of things because of an idea as you yeah. were cleaning toilets yeah. <laughs> during a school of ministry. And yeah. you follow through on this and you do this with the best of your ability. You find yeah. out you're actually reasonably good at it. Then as you grow and opportunity comes up, you're not sure, you're uncertain about it, but you hear God say, uh, are you going to, What's it going to be? Fear or faith? Faith propels you forward. Fear always shrinks back. And then you just literally thrust into a role that is like, <laughs> we're here we go. I got yeah. from cleaning yeah. toilets to now the front line of culture wars in the United States and around yeah. the world, gender, yeah. LGBTQ activism. Yeah. And you're right in the middle of that. And then somebody walks into the office and says, would you be willing to write on this gender conversion therapy and the controversy over that of particular activists wanting to take out wise counsel to teenagers so that they just propel headlong into making lifetime decisions that can affect them forever physically emotionally relationally sexually and you're like should i do this gonna be hurt me everybody is like it's probably landed on brandon's desk because of all of the more seasoned reporters are like ah it's a hot potato give it to the new guy Mm-hmm. And you hear God say, are you ashamed of the gospel? 
The yeah. gospel is good news, and you uh-huh. feel this commission. Uh-huh. I, I'm appointed for this. I was born for this. Yeah. That's how it happened. Whew. I, I think people need to hear that, yeah. grasp that, and realize then you've got a choice. Mm-hmm. And you said, I'm all in. All in. All in. Tell us what happened next. Well, then I fell down the rabbit hole. I started seeing how in purportedly mainstream publications, uh, males were being referred to as she and her. And it was so confusing. I couldn't even read it because I was, well, why are they calling males she? That's that's. And it was then I realized that, oh, they're trying to overwrite the sex of the human body with words. And it felt really Orwellian. I saw phrases like assign the wrong sex at birth, assign the wrong gender at birth. And it was just alarming how dystopian it all was. And, you know, journalists are charged with transcribing the first draft of history. And so there's this really overtly ideological perspective that's being presented as scientific fact to the public. And I realized I can't participate in this. I'm a journalist. I'm a Christian. I have to tell the truth. I believe in the material reality of biology. This is not good. Uh, And so I started sort of seeing some of that. um, But then I started learning about how this entire apparatus was sort of attached to this medical beast. And um, I remember going to a panel where it was actually a diverse group of more conservative leaning and left wing, both, but a panel where they all sort of connected the dots. A lot of the things that I had been learning about and seeing sort of was all put together and I remember learning just what puberty blockers do, uh, how they, these are these drugs that they give to young children who are gender confused to stunt their natural puberty. This is the same drugs that they have used to chemically castrate sex offenders and they treat osteo, uh, not endometriosis and prostate cancer with. And when I learned about just the effects of those drugs on those children, I say this all the time, but something inside me just snapped. And I said, I'm done. Like, I'm a, I have to do something about this. I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist. I remember going and talking to my editors. I say, it's so much worse than you think. Let's do, let's do some critical coverage. We ended up doing an article series that same year, exploring a lot of the dimensions of these kinds of things. But that then became my beat. And for five years, I just dug in. And one thing that I never did was use the politically correct lingo that all of the legacy corporate media did. We presented it just the basic science. And of course, we're informed by our Christian, you know, lens, our worldview. But, you know, a lot of non-Christian readers read the Christian Post now because of our refusal to go along with this dogma that claims to be rooted in science, but is in fact not at all. And I I kept, and and the deeper I went, I started learning about even more horrifying things like the fact that, and I can give you the citation in JAMA Pediatrics and other medical journals where they're cutting off girls' breasts as young as 13. They're harvesting, you know, young women's forearms to make penises for them. They're cutting off genitals of boys as young as 15 and 16. These, these surgeries are absolutely gruesome and of course, grossly unethical. Uh, I mean, and it, it's just, it's been a nightmare. Uh, and as a result of doing all of that frontline reporting, people started to notice. And since then, Andy, I've lost count how many desperate moms and dads I've fielded phone calls for, sometimes two or three a day, where parents are fighting to save their children from irreversible medical harm. Yeah. And I fell down an even deeper rabbit hole. I thought it was bad when I first learned about it. Then you start to hear from the victims, and it's just, it knocks the wind out of you. Yeah. So how much of this... You know, there's so much of this. I'm reading the book Bonhoeffer. I told you that. It's like Mm -hmm. people are not familiar with that. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, theologian, uh, pastor, spy, prophet. Read the book by Eric Metaxas. It's profound. Mm -hmm. The things that are now being publicly condoned in the United States and around the world was stuff that was in concentration camps in Germany in the 1940s. It's absolutely ridiculous and crazy and people are silent about it until now and god's taken someone brandon he said well god i choose to be available brandon talk to me personally about how when you jump into this i mean some people 
just shy away because they think, well, I'm going to get sued. I'm going to get shut down. I'm going to get canceled. I'm afraid for my life. Uh, were any of those fears or concerns real? And how do you stay in faith? Um, I, I, I just do my best to not ever, if I start to feel fear come on me, I just, I know. As soon as I start to feel it come on, it's just like, this is a choice whether or not I'm going to partner with this. Now, I, I sound like that's some, some, some Superman, which I'm not. But if you believe that God is indeed bigger. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, one little rock and Goliath fell. Like, you, you, you do have to have a conscious awareness of God being so much larger than even the worst kind of evil. And so... If you're grounded in that reality, it really helps. Yeah. Um, and of course, I try to be very diligent and show original source material. And I, I you can get sued if you you def defame or you, you report incorrectly. And uh, yeah, I I thank God for good editors. They're really I have wonderful editors here at the Christian Post, and so they really uh, back us up. And I I couldn't do the work I've done without them and CP is full of really good godly people. And so that's great. I've got good people who pray for me regularly and that really helps. Um, but I, I think what, what really spurs me on Andy is that I know that if I don't do this, yeah. that it's just going to keep going and that's yeah. worse. Yeah. And so someone has to, and so you just, you, I, there's been moments where I've just like, okay, this is what's in front of me. Yeah. May as well. Yeah. And it's just, you, you learn to just say, all right, let's just, let's just say yes every day. And maybe in due course, the Lord will move me on and he'll, some, somebody else will take up the charge. And I'm not going to do this forever, but for as long as I am and for as long as I sense God calling me to do it, I want to do it. Yeah. And you just, you just, you take it a day at a time. Yeah. And so, <laughs> just let it, you know, that's all you can do. Learn to live inside the grace of every day. Yeah. Um, but I think there, there's also just, there's something that happens when you, as I said, you know, a moment ago, when you hear from the victims Yeah. and you hear from, I know I'm getting heavy now, but like when you hear, when you hear their screams, when you hear their anguish and you hear how this has ruptured families and yeah. The desperation in their voice is just like, I will not be silent. Yeah. As for me, no. I mean, the Christian Post will not keep it on its conscience to be quiet about it. I mean, yeah. somebody has to. And so even if we're alone, we're going to speak. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to give a voice to those who have no voice. Um, so that, that really spurs me on. Um, but the other thing is just, it, it is as you do tell the truth, as you do this work, it feeds your boldness too. Yeah. And, yeah. and when you see, we are a Christian post, but a lot of people, if you tell the truth, even if they don't ascribe belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, they appreciate it. Yeah. And so I've been encouraged that I've heard from a wide variety of people who sometimes can't believe that they're reading the Christian post because they're sec very, very secular, yeah. but the truth speaks for itself. And yeah. that's empowering. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. I love that you piloted this and just that sense that, yes, there is a cost to doing this, yeah. but the cost not to do it is yeah. even greater. Yeah. And I just, I mean, the story in Esther yeah. planted perfectly yeah. for this time. And mm -hmm. if you don't speak up, then God will provide deliverance from another right. means, mm -hmm. but you won't be a part of it. That's and right. I just feel like that's the call for all of us to this code of silence is not okay. Um, and speaking up. So, Brandon, there's a whole heap more we could go, but I just want to dive straight into people who listen to this. Number one, if you listen to this and you have a conviction mm -hmm. that it's time for you to stop being silent, step up, I want you to be provoked to action. Now, you may not be a journalist and start writing on gender confusion and exposing a gender lie, but maybe that's standing up for truth in your workplace. Maybe that's confronting someone who's doing something wrong. Maybe that's reaching out and getting help and saying, okay, I refuse to sit in this dysfunction any mm -hmm. longer, regardless of what organization that you're at. So that's number one. 
And number two is to, I want you to have a sense of, are you operating out of fear or faith? Fear, you shrink back. Faith is the only thing that pleases God. And it's ordinary people clothed with a supernatural God. And you find yourself doing things that there's no way you could do in your own ability. Brandon is a great testimony of that. So what's the Lord convicting you to do? Or are you ashamed of the gospel? I want you to hear that and take the gloves off, people. Let's go. And But then finally, Brandon, what's some real... Pra- hey, my roommate was saying hello to me. I'm sorry. We're good. Okay. <laughs> No, that, that, yeah, that's great. Go ahead. Okay. Ask me. I'm sorry. So the final thing is, what's a practical thing that people can do to engage, particularly in this subject that you yeah. are dealing with? Yeah. Well, I don't want to give anybody any specifics because I think you have everybody has their own journey with the Lord. Um, but I would implore them especially around these kinds of issues, because if you don't think it's going to affect you, just wait. Uh, And so when it does, and even before it does, just ask the Lord what your part to play is is in it. And whatever he says, just be obedient. Yeah. I mean, I can't give, I mean, I I am not, I mean, there's all this legislation that's being, you know, proposed and enacted in some states and I have sort of mixed feelings about certain, I'm not, I'm not a, policy expert per se. And so I I don't, people ask me, what do you think about this and this and this? And I really don't know. I I, I don't, I want to stay in my lane and do what I know that I can do and do it well. And so I'm I'm not going to say that every, every person, they can't be a journalist or they, they can't, you know, whatever it is that they can do, God knows. And so if people are feeling convicted that they need to do something, Ask God for specifics. Say, yeah. okay, Lord, and, and it may it may cost you. Indeed, it might, but be obedient yeah. above all. Just lean in and and say, I'll do whatever you tell me. <laughs> Which is and great. So that's this, you need a lot of wisdom. You need yeah. wisdom because um, that th- you don't just jump in and be a bulldozer. And you know nobody does it perfect, but uh, yeah. just just be obedient above all. Yeah. So number one, I, I love it. I was talking to a client and he came across an article and it's the first time he came across an article about, you know, a, a child transitioning and what was involved and the messes. There's people now that have died. Is it like, it's just crazy. Or people yeah. that have gone through that and years later saying, what on earth? What is the rest of their life? Um, and he's like, this is crazy. We got to do something. And he reacted. And so I yeah. it was fun to go back to him. Well, Here's what understandable you but yeah yeah here's what yeah. you can do the, number one ask the lord like stay in love because otherwise you're making a mess yeah but then number two is like you've got this book Expo- like educate yourself yeah. be aware do not put your head down a hole and pretend this is not happening this is the world yeah. today it's what's going on it's going on everywhere yeah how do we get a hold of a copy of your book Go to christianpost.com slash ebook slash gender hyphen lie. We will we will post the link below, but the book is called Exposing, Exposing the, gender, the lie. gender Lie. And what is it about? Well, I co-authored it and it's free and downloadable, by the way. Everybody can have it for free. Um, we I wrote it with Jeff Myers, my friend, who's the president of Summit Ministries in Colorado. We wanted to tackle what gender ideology is and how it's driving this horrific medical and child abuse scandal uh, so that people could be equipped with the philosophical tools to understand it, how it functions, and then take steps to protect their families and their children from it, while also offering a redemptive alternative as set forth in the gospel. That's in the fifth and final chapter about what it means to be male and female, because we believe that you can't get Genesis 127 wrong, that we're made male and female in God's image without getting the whole gospel wrong. But we want to help articulate and flesh out the threat that this ideology ideology is, where it came from, how it captured institutions, how it twists language. We cover a lot of different men- dimensions, but we wanted a short, succinct read so that people could sort of understand the nuts and bolts of it without i mean because there's a lot of people writing books about this kind of stuff today but we aimed it at um pastors lay leaders youth ministers anybody really who's interested in the subject with uh just with respect to what is this thing called gender ideology what is it doing how is it affecting children and what can we do to prevent our children from being harmed by it yeah so number one ask the lord what are you what are you asking me to do 
and yeah. start with yes before even says anything. Like that's what you signed up for. And this is how we overcome. We love not our lives to death. Yeah. It's, it's time to take the gloves off and be followers of Christ and embrace the cost. Number two, grab a copy of the book. We're going to post the link below. You see that there. it is free. So you can actually, once you've got it, you can share it around. And I'd say number three, pray for Brandon, support him. Jump on the Christian post and you can, you better search all of the articles of what he's doing. Anything else that we you would suggest we do or engage with, Brandon? I would. Um, I uh, I think if you, if you, you can read, obviously read the book and that, that'll really spell it out for you uh, if you're more of a reader type. But I think movies and documentaries really speak at a whole nother level. Um, if you have Fox Nation, I'm in Tucker Carlson's documentary film called Transgressive, The Cult of Confusion, which was published in September. But there's an even better one, I think, called Dead Name, and that can be found at deadnamedocumentary.com. Uh, I think that the medical harms are probably going to really cause this whole tide to turn. Yep. But even more than that, when we see what this does to families, that really holds the key, I believe. Um, and this film, which I was honored to be a contributor in, made by a non-religious person, but it profiles three families that have been ripped apart by gender ideology. It's called Dead Name. Uh, and th so these families exp explain in very painful detail. It's not a fun Friday night watch, but it's necessary. You need to acquaint yourself with the suffering of these pa families. And it's kind of the window into my work, yeah. what I've been doing. But it tells their stories about what it's like. It kind of humanizes the issue. That fly on the wall, intimate portrait glimpse into what this, how this really impacts people. People don't know you won't see these kinds of stories featured in the New York Times or the or the Washington Post. The, the corporate press is completely tethered to this ideology. And so the real suffering of people, it falls to independent filmmakers, journalists like myself, yeah. others who will speak the truth. It's a very, very moving 50-minute film. Please go watch it. Small fee to watch, but very much worth it. Um, and I, I think, and I don't mean to scare people, Andy, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how grisly you want, want to, want to but uh, you understand that the ideologues and the people who are influencing this kind of medical malpractice against vulnerable children, youth, and young adults are some of the most evil and depraved people in the world. And I say yeah. that with all sobriety. I recently wrote a column to sort of stitched together a couple of things, including from the dead name film that I just referenced and urged everybody to go to watch. But there was a, there was a Dutch a Dutch medical report that reemerged recently where it talks about one of the boys who underwent one of those gruesome genital surgeries and how he died shortly after the surgery and the gory details of that. It was horrible, but all of that was allowed has been allowed because of the medical guidelines that have been uh, increasingly. Uh, adopted through these other medical organizations that are trustworthy uh, and they are influenced by people who they are they they fetishize some of the worst horrific most yeah. evil forms of child abuse and i'll just leave it there but if people want to read more about that i have to tip my hat to redux magazine r-e-d-u r-e-d-u-x-x -X, where they have uncovered how some of the people who have been influential in actually input to medical organizations uh, that they're actually activist groups that influence yeah. medical standards are uh, uh, child abuse aficionados. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's very, very, very dark and depraved. And it's not a tinfoil hat conspiracy. This is deeply evil stuff. Yeah. And I, I'm describing it like this because <laughs> I've had the experience on more than one occasion. And you'll see this if you, if you read our book, the exposing the gender lie, where it's so horrible that it's as though this kind of funk comes on people because they can't bear to think about it since it's yeah. so unpleasant. Yeah. But I implore you to believe me. You know, we have the receipts. It's really real. So in addition to getting the book and watching these documentaries, just know that there's, there, there's journalists who are doing some very, 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 very hard work yeah. to uncover the bottom of the barrel depravity that's driving this abuse of children this medical scandal and it's it's really really hard yeah. so please know that we're not making it up and we're not screaming into the void anymore we're being heard finally yeah um, 
but just recognize it for the sober, awful thing that it is. So here's what you can do if you're listening to this. Number one, pray about this. Just say, God, forgive me for being blind or turning aside. And I just hear the challenge. This is this Esther challenge of God will bring deliverance. Yeah. And But who knows whether you were born for a t- such a time as this. And if you don't stand up now, God will bring deliverance from another source and it won't be you. That's not to fear you. It's not to shame you. That's to say engage. And simply, it could be getting the book, reading the book, sharing this interview, jumping on being aware and no longer being silent. Uh, you have the opportunity to vote. You have the opportunity to email uh, leaders, school boards. It's time for us to engage. So thank you so much, Brandon. I bless you. We just pray the grace of God to strengthen you. And by the way, happy birthday. It's a great day to be alive. And I'm just so grateful that there are people like you that when you say yes to Jesus, you really, really meant it. So thank you. Thank you for your story. And I trust that readers, listeners watch this and share it and uh, grab that book and let's make a difference. Thank you.